Hey there. Subscribe to my channel. And also press this bell icon. So you never miss any new updates cause whenever we upload new video you will get a notification on your phone. Handling and storage of materials, hazardous chemicals, explosives and radioactive substances, housekeeping. 7.1 Handling and Storage of Materials and Hazardous Chemicals A. Classification of Materials Material can be divided into different categories and each category requires to be handled according to its inherent characteristics. The different categories of materials are dash, 1. Explosive Materials 2. Dangerous Substances 3. Safe Materials 1. Explosive materials. These materials are classified as dangerous substances and require specialized knowledge related to loading, transporting, unloading, handling, storage and its usage. 2. Dangerous substances. These materials include hazardous substances, which may be flammable, corrosive or toxic in nature. These materials are supplied with complete details available in Material Safety Data Sheet. MSDS. Each consignment, package or containers carrying such materials must enclose MSDS, which shall have following information about the hazardous substance. I. Product Identification 2. Hazardous Ingredients and its DLV 3. Physical and Chemical Properties 4. Fire and Explosion Hazard V. Health Hazard and Emergency Treatment VI. Reactivity data and neutralizing procedure. 7. Spillage hazard and containment procedure. 8. Safety precaution and emergency procedure. 9. First aid and medical treatment. X. Any special instruction. The container, package or drum containing such materials shall be clearly marked and labeled depicting following essential information conforming to UN classification of hazardous material. A. Name of the substance, trade and chemical name. B. Dangerous concentration. C. Safety precautions. D. Relevant hazard symbol. E. Health hazard and emergency treatment. F. Fire and explosion hazard. G. Date of expiry. H. The name and address of manufacturer or supplier. The standard safety symbol or alert sign must cover at least one-tenth surface area of the label and have a minimum area of one square centimeter. Refer Appendix 4 for industrial safety signs. Examples of materials, which come within these categories, are, dash. A. Flammable. These include low-flash materials such as aviation spirit, gasoline, methylated spirit, volatile solvents, paints varnishes and compressed gases such as acetylene, propane and butane. b. Corrosive, these include acids, alkalis and corrosion inhibitors used in the plant and laboratories. c. Toxic, these include chlorine, ammonia, H2S, various inhibitors, demulsifiers and other toxic substances used in plant and laboratories. Plastic and foam materials exposed to fire may emit toxic vapors. In case of leakage from a container having toxic material, the work in the affected area shall be immediately stopped and the concerned supervisor as well as the area fire station will be immediately notified. The supervisor shall take remedial action in consultation with the area HSE team. L. The work will not be resumed until the area is declared safe after proper atmospheric monitoring. The required personal protective equipment will be used while monitoring, investigating or fixing the source of toxic release. 3. Safe materials. These include materials such as foodstuffs, non-flammable items and equipment, which do not pose a fire or toxic hazard. However it may still cause injury to personnel if handled incorrectly. b. Cold stores, cold stores used for the preservation of food, ice, and other perishable materials should be thoroughly searched for the presence of any human being inside prior to locking it from outside.
A caution notice in this regard must be prominently posted on each side of cold storage doors. If the cold storage doors cannot be opened from the inside, a suitable warning device, operable from inside as well as a safety bell must be installed to alert in case of accidental entrapment. C. Materials Handling Many accidents are caused in the course of material handling. The safety aspects during the material handling operations such as loading, unloading, transportation, stacking and stores arrangement, must be duly considered. It is the responsibility of supervisors to ensure that personnel engaged in material handling and lifting operations have been adequately trained for the job. The material must be inspected for abnormality such as jagged edges, burrs, rough or slippery surfaces prior to initiate handling. The materials, which are greasy, wet, slippery or dirty, shall be wiped dry before handling. The workers must have adequate training in safety aspects of slinging, lifting and carrying of load including bulk handling of materials. The material must be stacked and handled taking all safety precautions. The required personal protective equipment such as hand gloves, safety boots, helmet and coverall must be worn while handling the materials. The mechanical devices such as hand guards, dollies, wheelbarrows and forklift should be used for bulk handling of materials. The workers must take necessary precaution while removing steel straps or wires from a packaged material. The site supervisor or the foreman should have sound judgment about the size and weight of the material for safe handling with appropriate appliance. While using lifting appliance, the workers must not stand directly under a suspended load and must keep away from wires or ropes under strain. The workers must be conversant with the safety in lifting and rigging operation as well as have familiarity with the banksman signals for such operations. The necessary care shall be taken while handling containers, which carry fragile items such as glassware or crockery etc. 1. Mechanical Handling the appropriate lifting devices shall be utilized for heavy items and bulk handling of materials. The drum shall be stacked on a pallet and similarly loose items should be secured inside a container before lifting or shifting with mechanical device. The materials inside a fragile container shall be protected with a substantially strong outer covering. Extreme precaution shall be applied while handling hazardous, explosive, toxic or flammable materials. The materials should always be stacked considering accessibility, critical requirement and other stock management criteria. The aisles in the storage area should be wide enough to permit safe access and maneuvering of mechanical handling devices. The ramps shall be utilized to transport materials over obstacles that cannot be removed. The weight shall be verified prior to lifting the materials. The ground realities such as any spillage prevalent danger or obstruction in the material handling area should be properly assessed. The load must be properly secured prior to raising or lowering it to prevent any accidental fall. The practical measures must also be taken to prevent a load coming into direct contact with other objects. The items must not be stacked loose on a platform, grating or pallet being hoisted. The load shall not be left suspended or remain unattended in the absence of lifting appliance supervisor. 2. Manual handling. The materials shall be stored on elevated shelves through appropriate use of ladders, stools or a lifting device as safe and convenient in the situation. The objects having sharp edges, pointed needles or barbed wires shall be stacked safely keeping sharp edges or needles facing towards inner side of the rack. A proper support and side restraint shall be provided between the rows for stacking drums, pipes, cartons and boxes etc. The objects susceptible to roll down or slip must be secured preferably through chalk hitch. Some of the materials are packed inside a bag and such bags should be cross-tied with opening interlocked towards the inner pile. The containers such as bins shall be securely anchored to prevent overturning. 3. Chemicals handling, the risk associated with the handling of chemicals must be thoroughly assessed by the chemist and occupational hygienist and accordingly protective measures are applied against the potential hazard. The Material Safety Data Sheet, MSDS, 
for each chemical must be available at worksite. The information on properties of chemicals, its harmful effects, associated hazards, recommended personal protective equipments and first aid instruction are included in MSDS. Refer to Chapter 4 for first aid information. The workers involved in handling of such harmful chemicals must use the required protective equipment and shall be trained in first aid procedures against the accidental exposure. D. Storage of hazardous chemicals and compressed gases, the chemical should always be stored separately away from other materials and access to chemical storage must be limited to authorized persons only. The manufacturer's instructions and MSDS must be followed for storage of chemicals. The following safety requirement must be observed. 1. Labeling, all containers, carboys, jerry cans, bottles containing chemicals must be clearly and distinctively labeled detailing product identity. Associated hazard, statutory warning, manufacturer's name and date of expiry etc. 2. Overhead storage facility, the glass containers carrying hazardous chemicals shall not be stored on elevated shelves or platform, rather such containers should be stored on a non-reactive skid at floor level for easier access and retrieval. 3. Inter-reacting chemicals, such chemicals must not be stored near each other inside the storage area and slash or laboratory shelves. It is not safe to store acids near alkalis. 4. Compressed gas cylinders, the compressed gas cylinders shall be kept securely stacked inside the purpose-built rack in upright position to prevent accidental fall. These cylinders must be kept away from heat or open flame. The protective cap should always be kept in place while transporting the cylinders. The cylinder should be transported through suitable trolley and under no circumstances a cylinder shall be dragged. E. Flammable and toxic chemicals, such chemicals shall be stored inside a well-ventilated room or fume hood, far away from any source of ignition. Moreover such chemicals should be stored at floor level in comparatively cold place without exposure to direct sunlight. An extraction duct closer to floor level must be provided in the store, where flammable vapors heavier than air might be released from such chemicals. A minimum quantity of such chemicals should be kept inside the laboratory. The containers for such chemicals must be examined for any physical damage prior to storage. It is not at all advisable to keep the containers 100% filled with such chemicals rather at least 5% by volume should be empty considering thermal expansion. F. Hazardous Chemicals Utilization in Operation, Process Plant the workers handling hazardous chemicals in operational area or process plant must be aware with risks involved and its protection measure. The pipelines carrying hazardous or corrosive chemicals should be suitably protected from any probable damage due to traffic accident. The drip tray should be placed to contain small leakage. The chemicals collected in drip tray shall be neutralized or otherwise made safe, before discharging into plant drainage system. A warning notice shall be posted at prominent location in the chemical handling to alert the personnel thereof. G. Disposal pits or open roof tank. The disposal pit or open roof tank containing harmful chemicals must be protected with fence of at least 3 feet high to prevent unauthorized entry, or accidental splash. The gangways attached to such pits or tanks must have handrails and tow board as further protection. H. First aid provision, the emergency shower and eye wash station must be provided in chemical handling area. The persons working in that area must be familiar with operation and utility of this emergency facility. Refer to Chapter 4 for first aid information. In case of chemical contamination, the affected part of the body, for example eyes, face, must be thoroughly flushed with clean water and eyes should be washed with eye wash solution. The medical assistance should be obtained as necessary. Any exposure to toxic chemicals through inhalation, skin absorption or ingestion shall require immediate medical attention and specialized medical treatment at hospital. 7.2 Hazardous and toxic liquids, gases, vapors, fumes and dusts, in a work area where toxic gases, 
vapors, dangerous fumes or dusts are likely to be found, the adequate ventilation shall be provided or alternatively exhaust appliances will be provided as near as possible to the source of origin. Special care shall be taken in the area prone to hydrogen sulfide hazard. A warning notice shall be posted at prominent location in the plant area to alert the personnel over there. Refer to Appendix 14 for further information on H2S hazard. A. Handling corrosive or hazardous liquids, a catch pits or bund walls shall be provided to contain the accidental spillage of a corrosive or hazardous liquid. Extreme care shall be taken handling, neutralizing or diluting acids or alkalis against splashing or exposure to heat emission. When corrosive or hazardous liquids or liquefied gases are being offloaded from a vessel or tanker, warning notices shall be prominently displayed on either side of the discharging point. The road tanker shall be completely stationary and engine switched off while discharging such hazardous liquid. The electrical cables and conduits shall be adequately protected against corrosion caused due to probable exposure in areas where corrosive liquid gases or fumes are likely to be found. The isolation valves or cock valves, which are not in regular use may cease to operate and should be subjected to periodic function test particularly for the line carrying corrosive liquid. B. Handling acids or alkaline solutions, acid carboys shall be stored in single tiers and never stacked one above other. The carboys should be lifted through the handle but not by the neck. The spilled acid shall be neutralized and washed away with water from a safe distance. The drums or carboys of acid shall never be decanted by applying pressure to the container. However the decantation may be done by applicable safe methods such as pouring, siphoning, hand pump or through discharge valve. A galvanized iron drums shall not be used for the storage or transportation of acid or alkaline solutions. The containers already open or contents partly used should not be transported. The acid-resistant gloves and other protective equipment must be used while handling such containers. The overhead tanks containing acid or caustic solution shall be equipped with overflow pipe routed to a safe disposal or drain system where any spillage can be neutralized as per instruction in MSDS. The areas below the tank shall be barricaded to prevent unintended ingress. The tank or vessel containing such acids or alkaline solutions must have a vent line open to the safe location. Refer to Appendix 1 on Chemical Safety Data. C. Handling corrosion inhibitors or acetization additives, all safety precautions against health hazard, reactivity, corrosive effect or fire and explosion risks shall be taken as stipulated in operating procedure and guidelines for such inhibitors and additives. It is always advisable to handle corrosion inhibitors or acetization additives in closed loop systems and as far as possible the use of open containers be avoided. The suitable personal protective equipment such as face shield, gloves and apron shall while handling these inhibitors or additives. In case of contamination to eyes, skin, or any other part of the body by such chemicals, the following first aid action is to be immediately taken. 1. Eyes, wash out thoroughly with the eye wash solution and refer to hospital for further medical assistance. 2. Skin, wash off thoroughly with soap and clean water and refer to hospital for further medical advice. 3. Clothing, remove any contaminated clothing and follow the first aid procedure as mentioned above for affected skin. Clothing, including rubber boots, which has been in contact with the inhibitor or additive shall be thoroughly cleaned with soap and water prior to using it. 7.3 Safety Precautions for Other Hazardous Chemicals A. Material Safety Data Sheet, MSDS, for hazardous chemicals, within the scope of this regulation, it is not feasible to provide a detailed account of safety precautions for all the hazardous chemicals that may be handled in the operational area. However it is strongly recommended to refer the MSDS manufacturer's instruction or health and environment team for any specific detail about the hazardous chemicals prior to its use. b. Handling drums of sulfuric acid, 
the drums containing sulfuric acid must not be exposed to direct sunlight. The key used for opening the drums should be fitted with protective guard plates. Moreover the drums containing acids should not be transported until the bungs have been slackened to relieve excess pressure and then re-tightened. A suitable tipping device should be used for decanting drums and carboys. Blowing with compressed air to remove the contents of a drum or carboys is forbidden. C. Handling wet, dry or reactive chemicals, wet, dry and reactive chemicals shall be segregated and stacked away from each other to prevent susceptible reactions in case of leakage or undesirable mixing. The defective container shall be removed from stock and the contents transferred to a proper container. D. Storage facility for oils and lubricants. Oils and lubricants shall be stored inside a designated storage area away from main stores. The storage area shall have proper drainage provision to contain the spillage. The store shall be well ventilated to dispose of any flammable vapors, released from oil, lubricants, heavier than air, which may settle at the floor level. Forced draft ventilation shall be installed if required to expel such obnoxious vapors. The electrical fittings and appliances installed in the store shall be suitable as per hazardous area classification. E. Storage of paints. The paints shall be stored in designated places located at a safe distance from other storage facilities. The storage area will have suitable protection against the fire hazard. The stacks and bins shall be of reasonable size and placed with adequate spacing between them to reduce the risk of fire spread from one to another. Extreme care shall be exercised while handling aluminium powder to control potential fire and explosion hazard. The workers handling the paints shall be equipped with required personal protective equipment. F. Handling of mercury. The safe handling of mercury requires good housekeeping, adequate ventilation, protective equipment and personal hygiene to avoid any poisonous effect. Any spilled mercury shall be picked up immediately through the use of a vacuum system. The areas where mercury is handled shall be equipped with temperature control system to prevent mercury vaporization at high temperature. 7.4 Explosive Materials General, the explosives are used in exploration, drilling, well surveillance and construction activities in the oil industry operations. The explosive materials will be handled by a duly authorized and specialist contractors engaged by the company for such operations. The contractor is responsible for purchase, storage, transportation and safe operations involving explosive materials, however, KOC, has the discretion to oversee the contractor's safety performance and provision in this regard. A comprehensive safety precaution and security arrangement shall be maintained at the site of explosive storage. Any unaccounted loss or missing of explosive items must be immediately notified to, KOC, as well as to the police for necessary investigation. It is essential to keep an updated stock position of explosive materials with the purpose to control receipt and dispatch of explosive items for work-related activities. The storage facility shall be equipped with temperature and humidity control system to prevent early deterioration of explosives. The offshore, installations, rigs, platforms and supply vessels have pyrotechnic items such as emergency signaling flares or rockets. These pyrotechnics must be stored separately away from other explosive materials. The signaling flares or rockets have a limited shelf life and any expired pyrotechnic should be returned to shore terminal for safe disposal. The operation of tools such as nail guns or rivet guns, which utilizes explosive cartridges, shall be strictly controlled in compliance to safety regulation in this regard. Refer to Appendix 17 for safety information on this issue. 7.5. Explosives, Storage Facility A. Fire Prevention 1. An explosive storage facility or premises enclosed by security fence is classified as hazardous area and accordingly safety regulations for such areas shall be strictly adhered. 2. All safety precautions shall be taken to prevent any accidental fire or explosion in the storage. 
The entry a naked flame or any source of ignition is strictly prohibited into the explosive stores. 3. The use of spark potential tools, for example steel hammer or drill machines etc., and non-intrinsically safe equipment, for example electric lamps, torches, lighters, camera and battery-operated appliances, inside explosive or detonator storage is forbidden. 4. The storage facility shall be kept free from any grit or sand accumulation and a high standard of housekeeping shall be maintained. 5. The storage facility shall be equipped with suitable and adequate fire extinguishers, heat and flame detectors as approved by fire team. 6. Warning Notice, written in Arabic and English, indicating the prevalent danger, smoking prohibition and authorized entry etc. shall be posted in the storage area with due approval from fire team. The notices shall be prominently posted at the location as hereunder. A fence and enclosure gates b alongside the security fence c storage entrance and containers b responsibilities of authorized person for explosives storage facility 1 a competent and authorized person shall be made in charge for each magazine or explosive store the concerned asset owner shall provide an updated list of such authorized and competent persons to the fire team. 2. The storage in charge must personally supervise the receipt and dispatch of explosives, any maintenance work or activity inside the enclosed fence boundary. On no account this responsibility is to be delegated to another person without prior approval from the company. 3. He will maintain a register detailing stock record and other relevant information as per format provided in Appendix 17 of this regulation. The register shall be available with the explosive certificate holder and must provide the details as mentioned here under a. Types and quantity of explosives received b. Details of explosive items issued and its purpose c. Quantity of explosives used in each operation d. Details of any misfired shots. e. Quantity of explosives returned to the stores. f. Details of explosive disposal and destruction of old stock. 4. Copies of explosive certificates, permits and updated stock registers shall be forwarded to fire team. 5. The record of pyrotechnics should be maintained in a separate register. 6. He will ensure monthly inspection of explosive stocks with due involvement of civil defense authority. C. Planning for explosive storage facility. 1. Licensing and construction of explosive storage, a license or permission, detailing type and quantity of explosive materials allowed for each storage facility or container, must be obtained from civil defense authority prior to storing such explosives. The proposed storage location shall be approved by fire team in due consultation with civil defense authority, who may advise on norms and standards for damage control issues in this regard. 2. Location, as a minimum requirement, magazines for permanent storage facility must be located at a distance of at least 100 meters from any other building, habitation, or place liable to be visited by company employees or public. Furthermore the proposed location must also be 270 meters away from thin traffic routes, 400 meters away from a heavy traffic zones and 500 meters away from a directional radio transmitters of 250 watts. 3. Security. A. Strict security shall be maintained in the explosive storage facility. B. Explosive storage facility shall be enclosed by suitable fencing located at a distance of at least 15 meters from the building or containers. In addition to the main entrance, an emergency exit away from the main gate shall be provided to the fenced enclosure. The gate should be strong enough and secured with heavy-duty locking arrangement. C. The asset owner and civil defense authority shall keep a set of keys for each magazine or explosive storage. These keys shall be accessible round the clock and police as well as, KOC, fire team shall be aware of its availability with the concerned officials. D. In the event of theft from explosive storage, 
the matter must be immediately reported to the police and respective area fire station. D. Safety precautions in explosive storage. 1. A license, permit must be obtained from the Civil Defense Authority for each explosive storage facility. 2. The storage facility shall be suitable from safety and security viewpoints type for the types and quantity explosives stored. 3. A person prior to entering such storage facility must take required precautionary measures such as wearing proper type of footwear, for example long neck rubber boots, to prevent contamination with grit. The boots with exposed metallic studs, nails or protectors should not be worn in explosive store. 4. The stores must be kept dry, scrupulously clean and free from grit materials. The sweepings dust from explosive store should be treated as explosives and removed for safe disposal as per procedure. 5. The boxes containing explosive materials shall be stacked on wooden shelves, which should be placed at least 15 cm away from the walls to facilitate air circulation. 6. The explosive material shall be stacked in issued ensuring the old items should go first to prevent deterioration or expiry of materials. 7. Any explosive, which not properly packed, shall not be allowed inside the storage. It is advisable to keep small quantity of explosives, maximum weight 5 kg, packed inside a stout wooden box with strong locking device. 8. The packing for explosive material or cartridge wrapping shall not be opened inside the storage facility. While issuing partial quantity from a complete package, the packing will be opened on suitable wooden bench kept outside the magazine storage facility. 2. A package already opened for issuing explosive materials should be kept separately from sealed packages. A package once open should be used. With as little delay as possible. If the explosive material has not been utilized on the day it was issued, then original packaging should be folded over and the case properly closed to ensure maximum protection. 10. The unutilized quantity of explosive materials shall be returned to the store under proper record in a stock register. The explosives return should be inspected for safety prior to accepting in the stores. 11. The open end of a detonating cord should be capped to prevent explosive falling from it on the floor. A floor contaminated with explosives is a potential source of explosion in case of frictional impact. 12. The explosives should not be exposed to a damp environment, heat or direct sunlight. Any naked flame, spark or source of ignition shall not be permitted within 25 meters 80 feet, from explosive storage facility. 13. Prior to authorizing any maintenance or modification work inside the explosive storage facility, all explosive materials will be removed to a safe and secure place and the store is properly cleaned. During such works the use of any spark generating tools is not permitted in the stores. It is advisable to use damp cloths in conjunction with the tools. 14. The safety rules as applicable explosive storage facility shall be prominently displayed near the entrance, refer to Appendix-17 for further detail. E. Detonator Storage 1. Under no circumstances shall detonators be stored with any other class of explosives. 2. All detonators must be kept in a separated store as equipped as that of other explosive storage. Moreover any loose detonator shall not be allowed inside the storage facility. 3. Any electrical detonator shall be stored or removed from its primary packing or container taking all precautions against induced current hazards. 4. The safety rules as applicable to detonator storage shall be prominently displayed at the entrance of stores, refer to Appendix 17 for further detail. F. Inspection of Explosive Stores 1. Team Leader, Stores Operations or his authorized representative should inspect each explosive storage facility at least every three months to ensure the compliance of relevant regulations in this regard. 2. Any explosive, that shows sign of deterioration, 
must be removed carefully and disposed of in accordance with manufacturer's instructions and safe disposal procedure. 3. The date, time and observations of such inspections shall be recorded in the register at explosive stores under endorsement of inspecting authority. g. Safe disposal of explosives and detonators. 1. Any explosive material, which is exuding liquid, should not be touched and manufacturer as well as disposal squad should be consulted for proper disposal as per procedure. The assistance from fire team and civil defense authority shall be sought in this regard. 2. Any explosive material, whether unused or returned, contaminated with water, dirt or any other element should be examined to ensure separation of detonators and blasting explosives. 3. Any unutilized or loose explosive material should be properly wrapped and safely stored to prevent contamination. 4. The unutilized or loose explosive materials should be consumed or disposed of within one week of its return to the storage. In any event contaminated material should not be allowed to accumulate over a long period. 7.6. Transportation of Explosives A. Portable Containers for Transportation of Explosives 1. The minimum required quantity of explosives should be transported to the site in its original packing or inside a custom-made containers. 2. It is strictly prohibited to transport any blasting explosives and detonators in the same container. The detonators should be carried separately. 3. The portable container along with its tight-fitting cover must be of non-ferrous material, such as leather, molded rubber, plastics, wood or reinforced canvas, and strong enough for the purpose. However other attachments such as lock, rivets etc. shall be made brass. B. Transportation of explosives through vehicles. The vehicles for transportation of explosive materials must be mechanically perfect in compliance with the company regulations. Refer Chapter 17 for Vehicles and Mobile Plant, and in addition the following mandatory requirements also be fulfilled. A. The driver of the vehicle shall be accompanied with one attendant, who has been trained in handling of explosive materials. No extra person is permitted to travel in a vehicle carrying explosive materials. B. It is strictly prohibited to carry lighter, matches or any source of ignitions in such vehicles. Moreover smoking is not permitted while transporting explosive materials. c. The suitable and adequate number of fire extinguishers approved by fire team must be available in the vehicle for convenient access in case of emergency need. d. The vehicle shall have non-ferrous surface, such as wooden or tarpaulin covered surface, for placing boxes or cases of explosive materials. The boxes shall be adequately secured to prevent any movement or shock during transportation. e. The explosive items and detonators must be transported separately and shall not be carried in the same vehicle. No explosives should be carried in the driver's cab. f. No loose explosives shall be transported except appropriately packed in suitable receptacles. g. Extreme care must be taken while loading or unloading explosives. The boxes must not be dropped, jolted or dragged. The engine must be stopped during loading, unloading of explosives. H. The vehicle should have sufficient fuel for the journey prior to loading of explosive materials, as the refueling is not permitted during transportation period. It is also not allowed to carry any flammable liquid, gas or other combustible materials such as oil-soaked rags in the vehicle. I. As far as possible the vehicle carrying explosive materials should complete its journey without any break. However if journey break or halt cannot be avoided, it should be ensured that the vehicle is not parked in a built-up area, near occupied buildings, or in proximity to overhead cables. K. The vehicle should carry two battery-operated hand lamps of intrinsically safe design, which are duly approved by fire team. One of the hand lamps is fitted with red glass whereas the other one has clear glass for use after dark in event of a stoppage. L. The vehicle shall have clear sign posted to alert for explosive transportation. 
Additionally red flags should be hoisted at front and rear end of the vehicle. The vehicle should be escorted by police while traveling on highways and public road. C. Action in case of vehicle breakdown slash accident. 1. No fire involved. A. One person either drive or his attendant will stay with the vehicle whereas other will inform police about the incident, location and the contents of the vehicle. B. The battery-operated hand lamps, clear glass, at front end, and red glass, at rear end, will be fitted in the vehicle to illuminate in the dark alerting oncoming traffic. C. The respective area fire station and the sponsoring team shall be notified. 2. Fire involved. A. Attempt to extinguish the fire and if possible remove small packages containing explosives or detonators to a safe place. B. One person either driver or his attendant will be stationed ahead of vehicle whereas the other will be at rear side to alert the oncoming traffic from both directions. C. Inform police or respective area fire station and request the passerby to raise the alarm. D. Notify the sponsoring team as soon as possible. 7.7. .7. Safe use of explosive materials. A. Authorization. 1. Explosives shall not be handled, loaded or disposed except by a competent person, shot firer, who is trained and experienced in all aspects concerning safe use of explosive materials. 2. The appointed shot firer shall be a competent person authorized to carry out jobs involving explosive materials. 3. The competent person shall be authorized in writing by the contractor responsible for the job and due agreement with sponsoring team. An up-to-date lists of all authorized personnel shall be forwarded to fire team also. b. Precautions in handling and preparing explosives. 1. The required quantity of explosive materials shall be withdrawn from the store or a temporary magazine for immediate work to be undertaken. Any unused explosive must be returned to the store, magazine without delay. 2. It is strictly prohibited to carry lighter, matches or any source of ignition within 30 meters, 100 feet, from a box containing explosive materials or loose explosives. Smoking is also not allowed in such areas. 3. Any operation involving a source of ignition shall not be carried out at the site except by the authorized person designated for such jobs. 4. The danger zone must be clearly demarcated and shall remain so until the worksite supervisor, shot fire provides clearance for resuming normal operation after completion of jobs involving explosives. No person except those directly concerned with operational requirement shall be allowed within the danger zone until completion of the job and the area is declared safe by the worksite supervisor, shot firer. 5. The access to danger zone shall be controlled by guards, watchmen carrying red flags, whistles or bullhorns posted at a safe distance to warn the people approaching the area. 6. The work involving use of explosives must not be carried out under conditions of thunder, lightning, heavy rain, sand storms, high winds and inclement weather conditions. 7. Only purpose made and duly approved electrical apparatus equipment maintained in good working order shall be used to test circuits and fire the electrical shots. 8. In the event of a misfire the correct procedures as outlined in paragraph 7.7.c shall be followed. 9. No excessive force should be used in the charging process or while inserting cartridges into a shot hole. It is to be ensured that the holes drilled to receive charges should be sufficiently large allowing easy passage to the cartridges. No ferrous element is to be inserted into a hole after a cartridge has been lowered into it. In case of tamping need, a wooden rod without any ferrous part, is to be used. 10. The paper or plastics wrapping on explosive cartridge is provided to prevent ingress of any dirt grit or rock and therefore should not be removed to facilitate charging of the shot hole. 11. 
any safety fuse shall be cut neatly and inserted safely into a detonator after blowing off any sawdust it is strictly prohibited to attempt removal of an obstruction within a detonator using a pin, piece of wire or similar implement. The fuse shall be secured to the detonator by nipping the latter with special pliers, crimpier, provided for the purpose. Extra care must be taken to prevent detonator end, containing mercury fulminate, being knocked, dented, pinched, or otherwise damaged during operations. 12. To avoid the risk of a misfire, detonators should be inserted for at least two-thirds of their length into the charge and when the later has a paper wrapping, the paper should be closed around the fuse or igniting wire and tied with twine. Electric detonators should be buried in explosives. 13. The shot firer must always keep the means to initiate the shot that is exploder handle, matches, in his possession until he is ready to fire the shot. All connections should be made by the shot firer himself. The exploder handle and the shot firing leads are not to be attached to the exploder but just before the shot is to be fired and it must be removed immediately after use. 14. Prior to a shot being fired, the shot firer must ensure that, a, clear and adequate warning has been given. b, all approaches into the danger zone are properly controlled by guards with red flags. c, he and others have taken adequate cover. 15. When firing preliminary chambering or springing shots, at least 30 minutes must be allowed to elapse from the firing of a shot to the charging of the next shot in the same hole. The hole should be swabbed out with water if fuse firing is employed. 16. The number of shots to be fired must be counted. If the number of explosions is less than the number of charges set for firing, precautions for misfires as per paragraph 7.7.C must be adopted. A maximum of 10 charges should be prepared and loaded for any single firing operation. 17. On successful completion of all shots the shot firer shall check the site of the explosion, debris to ensure the absence of cartridges, detonators or part of cartridges from misfired charges or cutoffs. The all-clear signal shall be given by the shot firer only after confirming the area is free from explosive and fumes. 18. Prior to authorization of any work involving use of explosive, the contractors shall provide a copy of field operating procedure to the sponsoring department and fire team. The field operating procedure shall clearly lay down safety precautions and steps for preparation and arming of explosives including action to be taken in the event of misfires. C. Misfires. 1. The shot firer must be fully aware of the procedures to be adopted in the event of misfire. Each misfire must be treated carefully taking all precautions relevant to particular explosive and firing method being used. In the event of a misfire, all concerned persons at work site must be warned of the incident and normal operation shall not to be resumed until clearance is given by competent person. 2. If a shot misfires or does not explode at the intended time, no person should approach it until it is exploded or time interval, not less than 30 minutes for firing by safety fuse or not less than 10 minutes for firing by electricity, has elapsed. A charge, which has misfired, must not be unrammed, bored or picked out. 3. If it is essential to bore a hole near a misfired charge, extra care must be taken to prevent ignition of the unexploded charge. 4. After a second shot has been fired near the misfired charge, a thorough search for the unexploded charge must be made by the shot firer before declaring the area safe for normal operations. All misfires record detailing circumstances, location and time of occurrence shall be maintained in the format as shown in Appendix 17. D. Precautions against extraneous electricity during electric shot firing, unless suitably protected. Electric detonators may be accidentally fired due to electrical energy entering the shot firing circuit from an outside source. Such source may be lightning, static electricity, stray current, galvanic electricity and electromagnetic radiations from radar, radio, television, helicopters, 
etc. The shot firer or site supervisor for blasting operations must be familiar with such hazards prevalent in the area. Main safeguards include 1. The electric detonators should be kept properly shielded inside packing or containers. 2. Suspension of any blasting operation during inclement weather conditions, such as lightning, thunder, sandstorms etc. 3. Care to earth circuits, machinery and persons before making final connections to detonators. There might be static buildup resulting from weather conditions. 4. Handheld radio and portable transmitter are not to be taken within a range of 150 meters from site of operation. 5. All radio communication and equipment within a range of 150 meters will be switched off prior to any firing operations involving electrical detonators. 6. Any electrical detonator will not be stored or permitted within a range of 150 meters from a radio communication transmitter. 7.8 Explosive Ordnance Disposal, EOD A. The Danger the company faced a big challenge to clear a large amount of unexploded ordnances, which were found in all areas of Kuwait after liberation from the Iraqi invasion. Post-liberation a program of explosive ordnance disposal, EOD, has been led by Kuwait Ministry of Defense, KMOD, to clear areas from dangerous unexploded ordnance. Although great progress has been achieved in respect of odd clearances, However complete assurance for all operational areas within, KOC, premises cannot be guaranteed due to various factors such as, type of clearance utilized, variety of problems encountered at different situations including sand shifting, excavation works and oil lakes formed. It is to realize that odd problem may diminish ultimately but will remain a potential threat for foreseeable period of time. Keeping such considerations in view Protective measures and safety aspects have been formulated, which must be implemented by all employees belonging to company or contractors. The adherence to such measures will reduce the risk pertaining to explosive ordinances. b. Precautionary measures The following precautionary measures shall be ensured to reduce the risk from unexploded ordinances. 1. No work shall be carried out till the area has been declared free from explosive ordinances. The clearance certificate for any area within the company remises shall be issued by safety team. 2. The workers prior to deployment in the field must be made aware of prevalent danger due to possible presence of explosive device. 3. The workers shall attend odd familiarization program conducted by safety team on request from sponsoring department. Refer to Appendix 17 for odd familiarization request. It is mandatory for company and contractors employees to attend odd awareness session. 4. It is advisable not to take any shortcut while traveling in the oil field areas, rather only designated routes should be followed. C. Odd certification. 1. It is not permitted to visit or carry out any work in the area, which has not been declared free from explosive device and odd certificate has been issued for the same. 2. Odd certification shall be issued on printed format detailing the extent of clearance duly marked in the map or site plan. The verbal clearance in this regard will not be acceptable. 3. The clearance certificate issued by odd contractors shall be approved by Kuwait Ministry of Defense along with endorsement for quality assurance. These certificates shall be issued through safety team to the sponsoring department under a covering letter in this regard. 4. If the proposed work area has been previously issued odd clearance and the sponsoring department has its record, then the work may proceed without any further certification. 5. In case of any doubt regarding odd certification for the proposed work site, it is strongly recommended to seek clearance from safety team by submitting standard request as per procedure. Refer Appendix for odd request. D. Action on finding suspected unexploded ordnance, even in odd certified areas, there is possibility of explosive presence due to shifting sand, excavations etc. The following precautionary measures shall be kept in view to minimize the dangers associated with discovery of suspected explosive ordnance. 
1. Do not touch the suspected ordinance. 2. Stop the work immediately, clear the area and inform all personnel of the prevalent danger. 3. Note down the location of unexploded ordnance or suspected object, and place visible markers at a safe distance. 4. Inform respective area fire station immediately. Through radio on, KOC, fire channel. A major portion of oil lakes have been drained and the oil containment recovered, leaving layers of oil contaminated sludge which solidifies over a period of time and makes it possible to access the oil lake areas. During firefighting operations on burning oil wells, some of the oil lakes were covered with gash to allow access. It is to be noted that remaining oil lakes are still a potential hazard and presence of explosive ordnance cannot be ruled out. Under no circumstances an attempt be made to enter or excavate within an oil lake. A formal lot request should be submitted to safety team prior to any access or work in such areas. F. Minefields and previously mined areas, mines were laid around some oil field areas. Minefields and previously mined areas are normally fenced with barbed wire and danger sign posted. Most of these minefields have been already cleared however the possibility mines presence cannot be completely ruled out. Under no circumstances shall any attempt be made to enter or work within minefield or previously mined areas. In case of any doubt for location of minefield, safety team should be contacted for confirmation, advice and assistance. A formal lot request should be submitted to safety team prior to any access or work in such areas. G. Offshore odd clearance the company has by and large completed odd clearance in offshore locations under its jurisdiction. However due to various factors such as sand, slit coverage, or wind, tidal action etc. the presence of explosive device cannot be completely ruled out. Prior to any non-routine offshore activities such as, construction or dredging, a formal request for odd clearance shall be made to safety team. Refer Appendix 17 Fraud Clearance Request 7.9 Radioactive Materials and Ionization Hazard A. General, there are various industrial activities such as non-destructive testing, detection system and parameters monitoring which involve use of radioactive source. It is well known that exposure to high doses of radiation may result in physical injury, malignancies, genetic effects and even death. The emissions are not detected by any of the human senses and the dose from successive exposures is cumulative. Damage can be caused in one of two ways, by general exposure of the body to radiation, or by ingesting or inhaling radioactive particles, which can then affect internal organs of the body. It is therefore extremely important to control the use of radioactive source, based on three prevalent principles. Use of radioactive source must be justified confirming a superior result in comparison to any other technique. Exposure to radioactive source must be kept as low as achievable. Dose limits for an individual must not be exceeded. In the state of Kuwait, Radiation Protection Department under Ministry of Public Health is the ultimate authority, which monitors the radioactivity standard supplied in KOC. However in KOC, the responsibility for all such matters rests Radiation Protection Safety Officer, RPSO, Inspection and Corrosion Team. The company RPSO must be consulted on all matters related to radiography and he, she will advise on the appropriate safety procedures. Refer to Appendix, 11 and Radiation Protection Manual issued by Standards Team in this regard. Any radioactive substances brought for company requirement must be reported and registered with consent of RPSO prior to its arrival. A weekly statement of all radiography works duly logged by worksite supervisor and a monthly returns detailing radiation source movement M. Please give comment and suggestions. Thank you. Subscribe our YouTube channel and hit the bell icon for more updates. Thank for visit our channel. See you next class. Thank you.
Hey there. Subscribe to my channel. And also press this bell icon. So you never miss any new updates cause whenever we upload new video you will get a notification on your phone.